All right. Um, I left off with uh, the South was cool with Cuba because they were pro-slavery. All right. There'd be a, a number of these slave rebellions that that occurred. Probably the big ones, the Haitian Rebellion. There was something called the Baptist War in Jamaica. That was part of the British Empire. The most famous one in American history, Nat Turner's Rebellion. Have you guys learned about that? Heard about it, it was in 1831. Um, a major slave rebellion in, I want to say Virginia. And it was brutally subdued by... Um, by Southern authorities. Now, the the first step in getting rid of slavery is going to be getting rid, rid of the slave trade. Uh, the first country to do that is the United Kingdom, 1807. I have a history professor who always said it was kind of ironic. Uh, Great Britain was the last major European power to get involved in the slave trade in the first to get out of it, but they traded the most slaves and made the most money off of it. Um, they abolished it in 1807. Now, technically, I'd say technically the United States did it first. But if you read Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution, which was ratified, you know what year, Wade? We were talking about this yesterday. What year would the Constitution have been ratified? 1787. Well, it was uh, first drafted in 87, I think ratified either 87 or 88. You know, in Section 1, Article 9, it talks about in 20 years, the, uh, the government will be able to ban the transatlantic slave trade. Um, they didn't want to ban it right away because they thought it was going to uh, hurt the relationship northern states have with the southern states. But America already in the 1700s had planned to end the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, in France in 1820, they might say, well, why do you ban the slave trade but not slavery altogether? Do you think that there could have been people who thought, well, slavery is okay, but the, slave, the transatlantic slave trade is really bad? Do you think that could have been true? Because what was it like? What was what were the conditions like for slaves on the ships coming over? Like, do you have any idea what the death rate was? Something like thirty, like up to thirty percent of slaves died aboard the ships because they were. We you know we looked at those pictures in the in the earlier unit, right? With the transatlantic slave trade, how they were packed in there like cattle. Um, so that's why the slave trade is going to go first, but it, it's only a matter of time before slavery is going to be done away with. Because it's just, it's in too much of a contrast to the ideals of the Enlightenment and, uh, and capitalism. Because, you know, we talk about it in American history a lot. How could Thomas Jefferson write that all men are created equal in the Declaration of Independence and at the same time own slaves? It, it really was a, uh, a confliction. And even Jefferson would admit, it's like, yeah, it, it, it's... Uh, because Jefferson talked about how slavery was a bad thing. He just also said, well, slavery is bad, but uh, black people are still inferior, and uh, it's going to be hard to get to, do, to, uh, to get rid of it. I think it really was just a matter of time. The writing was on the wall. Now, the South, they kind of knew that, especially towards the beginning of the Civil War. and They, they could tell that slavery was under threat because they saw other countries were abolishing it. And, uh, and they knew the North was very much against it. Um, and that's why the, the South became very defensive around slavery uh, throughout the 1800s. Then the actual abolition of slavery, uh, obviously, we know 1865, right after the Civil War, uh, the 13th Amendment, not the Emancipation Proclamation, because the Emancipation Proclamation Uh, that freed slaves that were held in rebel territory during the war. The 13th Amendment actually freed all the slaves. So we know for us, it's 1865. Uh, we're behind uh, the UK and France. UK's 1833, France 1848. Now remember, you know, for those, those European countries, they're mostly getting rid of slavery in their colonies. Now, I don't think you really would have seen very much slavery in Great Britain itself. There probably would have been some slaves that, you know, were like servants. 
But the vast majority of like those, the vast majority of like those plantation slaves, you're going to find in their colonies, mostly in the Caribbean and Latin America. Uh, Spain, it's going to be later, 1873. Uh, I don't have Cuba up there, but I know Cuba. Well, sorry, Cuba uh, was still part of was still part of the Spanish Empire. So Cuba was 1873 because it was part of Spain. And then Brazil, the last um, Western country to legalize slavery um, in 1888. Now, uh, oftentimes we focus on this slave trade in the West, but what slave trade are we not talking about? The, the what? The, the Middle Eastern, that involving the Ottoman Empire. Uh, that slave trade will continue up until about 1900. And we might, I think we'll try to, we looked at that uh, kind of closely um, uh, when we studied the Ottoman Empire. I want to revisit, revisit that because that slave trade will yeah, continue up until the the 1900s. It doesn't get talked about a lot. You know, a lot of people talk about how America was late. You know, compared to some countries, America was late. But you look at the Ottoman slave trade that continued up until the 1900s. Okay, uh, at this point, I want to start to transition from slavery because I was hoping to cover more of that tomorrow, or sorry, cover more of that yesterday. Uh, transition from uh, slavery into this, what I would call, independence and westward expansion in the, the New World, North America and South America. You know, uh, this is something that's covered quite a bit in, in American history, so I won't cover, uh, won't cover it uh, too much, but I want to tie this into the, uh, the age of empires and kind of compare how um, the experiences of the natives at the hands of the colonizers, in, it's going to be pretty similar in in, uh, in North and South America as to like Africa, in India when we when we move to those regions. So a big theme at this point, we're in the early 1800s. Uh, during the early 1800s, the Spanish Empire will collapse, uh, and that's going to be probably the, about the last nail in the coffin for the Spanish Empire. It had, it had been, once been great, uh, you know, about like the 1500s, but it uh, had begun to decline in the 1600s, and then it lost almost all of its colonies uh, in the early 1800s. There's just one ha handout I have um, today. Um, and. I've got, uh, oh, did I give you that one? Did I give it to you at the beginning? Yeah. Um, uh, right. <laughs> okay. Most Latin American independence is uh, going to be inspired by this man, Simon Bolivar. Uh, he was, um, uh, he lived in the Spanish Empire uh, in what is now Mexico. He traveled to um, Europe in the early 1800s, and he was really inspired by the Enlightenment. And I think a lot of ways also he's inspired by Napoleon uh, Bonaparte, I think you can see that in the way he dressed. Um, he wanted to be kind of a Napoleon-like figure um, and bring independence to Latin America. And he inspires a wave of revolutions that occur uh, throughout uh, Mexico, Central America, South America, uh, and I believe between 1821 and 1840, almost all those Latin American countries are going to going to gain independence. I'd say that's you know one more example of how uh, imperial power at this time continued to shift more and more towards Great Britain. Because Spain had um, Spain had lost a lot of its power. Um, 
once again, though, when these countries in uh, Latin America become independent, they're they're going to bring some of those Enlightenment ideas, but they're going to continue some of that class structure of um, that had been put in place by the Europeans. So let me grab the books. I know there's a table of this in your book as well. Go to page. 656. Um, and I, I would also put in the definitions for, say, the, the peninsulars, the Creoles, um, the mixed race peoples. Now, there were two types of, of mixed race peoples. Mestizos, that's essentially your Hispanic person, someone who has uh, Spanish and Native American descent. Mulattoes would have been someone who was part uh, Spanish or part European and part um, part African. Now, of course, you know because this was based a lot on the European class structure, it continued in Latin American countries. So the Peninsulars, that was someone who was born in Europe and or born in Spain, and they were generally the, the most elite class in Latin American countries. Creoles were Europeans or Spaniards who were born in the colonies. And they were even a little bit below probably the elite of the elite. And then of course, you know, the common theme throughout almost all the imperial age is the less white you are, the lower you're going to be on the, the social scale. So uh, the mestizos and mulattoes are going to be below the whites, but they're above pure Native Americans or um, pure Africans who are oftentimes the slaves. And as we move on through the imperial uh, age, you'll, you'll see this trend continue. Really, not any different than in America. Oftentimes, uh, mulattoes who were part African, part white, they weren't treated quite as bad as, as um, black slaves, put it simply. So as we talk about North and South America in, in terms of the imperial age, um, you see Latin America gaining independence. And the U.S. is going to expand. I know you guys have seen a map like that, probably from world or American history. It, you know, it's kind of a kind of a timeline and a map put together showing how the United States expanded across the continent. Now, we're in the age of imperialism, and a big debate today is: Was America an imperial power? Ah. I would say yes and no. I, I'm, I'm kind of I'm conflicted myself. Um, I would say it was definitely not a colonial power like most of the European countries because it had very few overseas colonies. Um, but if you're talking like an empire, you could maybe compare it to an empire like the Roman Empire, where it expanded, and as it expanded, it incorporated uh, new territory into the country. Like, uh, you know, so when the Romans conquered what is now France, they called it Gaul. 
That became a Roman province called Gaul. When they conquered Britain, that became a Roman province called Britannia. Uh, and I would say America expanded a lot the same way. You know, we were not, Iowa was not originally part of the United States. But we are a state like New York or Pennsylvania or any one of the original states. We have the same status and rights as other states. And that way, I would say, was really not a colonial, it was not a colonial empire. But if you're talking about an empire that's conquering land, subduing native peoples, like the Romans did, then yeah, I would say America, that's true for America as well. Um, I don't say it was like a colonial empire because, you know, when we talk about colonial empires, you know, India was part of the British Empire. Do you think the colony of India had the same rights and privileges as England back on the, the British homeland? No, not at all. Go, it goes back to that um, idea of the metropole or the motherland, motherland and, um, and the colony. You know, there really is no motherland in America. It, all, it, it is all the motherland. Um, now, as we move forward, we'll see there were a few American, true American colonies, you know, but it's not really a colonial empire. Now, some people would argue it is an empire mostly because the people who got colonized, in a way, were the Native Americans. Um, and that, that's true to a certain extent. Now, during this period, we're talking about the, the uh, age of empires. Two really important U.S. policies during this time period, the Monroe Doctrine and Manifest Destiny. The Monroe Doctrine said the U.S. will avoid affairs and conflicts in Europe while also opposing European colonialism in the Americas. Well, why do we not want the Europeans to expand here? Because we want as much of that as ours as possible. You know, like if I go back to this map right here, uh, you know, say during the early 1800s, you know, we didn't know that this was all going to become part of America. We look back today and we're like, yeah, that's all part of America. They didn't know that back then. They thought maybe they'd get Canada. Maybe they could get some of the Caribbean. The point is, we want to dominate as much of the continent as possible. So that's why we want to oppose uh, European uh, colonialism. Uh, manifest destiny was the belief that America, I, the way I put it, is America's morally justified to spread across uh, the con I say continents because uh, there were some people that thought even you know maybe we would one day expand into South America. Right. Uh, go back into go into your journals now. I didn't. Um, I didn't have time to put this in, but I want you to answer. I want to look at two two political cartoons from this time period. This one represents Monroe Doctrine. Question are we on in the journal? Four. So we've done we've done four? No. We've done we've done three. Okay, so question four. Um, how does the political cartoon illustrate a policy of Monroe Doctrine. And then second one there.
let me know when uh, when you're ready to move on to the second. Idea that is a really good question that I think I may have, I think I knew at one point, but uh, I can't tell you right now. Carl, I don't know what to say. Right, and then, uh, so that, you know, that one illustrating Monroe Doctrine, then how would, how would this help illustrate the beliefs of Manifest Destiny? I think this painting really says a lot. You guys, did you ever see this in history class? Um, I mean, what, what do we see when looking at it? Like, yeah. This we would say is, you know, the United States. This is the Western frontier. Now, um, I know I've seen this throughout my life, but like, what are some more of the like? Obviously, okay, we see you know people moving across the continent. How about in terms of like lightness versus darkness? What do we see in the painting? Where is the light coming from? So, like where America would already be, right? And over here, where America has not gone yet, it's dark. They're living in darkness. And it's our obligation to spread the ideals of America across the continent. So, I'll put it there. Now, what, do you, what do you see in that painting? There's there's a lot of different things, right? You know, there's 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 a lot going on in that painting. And I'm gonna we come back to that throughout the unit. I was, I don't know how long that lecture was going to take, but maybe going to go into a uh, video, but we might have to do that tomorrow. So, when you're done with that, let's call that a day because we're almost out of time.